everyone to this webinar and thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, today we will be talking about the challenges when implementing local content in Africa and Latin America. Before starting, I wanted to briefly introduce my colleagues, Juan Jose Herrera and John Okira. They will be presenting today. Juan Jose is an economist and he's a coordinator of the Extractive Industries Program in Grupo Faro. He has been involved in several projects um, rela uh, related to destructive industries uh, at the national and local level in Ecuador. And currently he is part of the team researching local content practices in Africa and in Latin America as part of the LI initiative. Uh, John Okira. He uh, is an economist as well, and he's a research officer at ACOD. His research includes uh, land, uh, land issues, education, health, uh, social protection, local development, uh, and innovation. He's also currently a part of the team researching local content in Africa and Latin America. So before we start, I just wanted to remind you that you can ask um, any questions or you can make comments using the chat channel. And you can also change the language of the presentation by changing it um, on, on your screen. Uh, if you have any questions or if you experience any technical difficulties, uh, please, please you can press uh, the question mark that is uh, um, at the left side of your screen so we can assist you in any way. So um, I think uh, we can start now. Um, uh, so welcome, um, welcome Juan Jose. Uh, you have the floor now. Well, here we are in Latin America. Welcome to all of you listening from Africa. Thank you, Marcella, for being the moderator for the panel. As, as Marcella said, we're going to be talking a little bit about the challenges that we've seen during the implementation of local content policies here in Latin America. I'm, I'm from Ecuador, and John Okira, my colleague, will be talking a little bit more about the issues in Africa. As Marcella said, any questions that you might have, please and do them, make them Ask them directly on the chat, and she will record them, and at the end, we will be able to have a look at them. So, just to start then, I'd, I wanted to mention, tell you something about the challenges that we've seen during the implementation of local content here in Latin America. And just to, as most of the participants are from Africa, to tell you something about the region, I've prepared this chart on the seven countries in Latin America which produce oil and gas. We can see that we've got Venezuela, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, and, and in Grupo Faro, we've conducted a study on the local content policies in these countries, and I'll talk about that later. As you can see, there are countries like Venezuela that have major oil reserves. And in regional and world level, there are also countries which have important reserves like Mexico and Ecuador and slightly less Colombia and Argentina. The same goes for gas in Venezuela. There are major uh, wealth level reserves and Mexico and Bolivia and Argentina have important reserves which are important for their economy as well. There's a similar production in petrol between Venezuela, Mexico and Argentina which is of about 2,626,000 of barrels and down to Argentina with 600,000 barrels a day. That, that gives you an idea of production in the region. So as I was saying, of these seven countries, in Grupo Faro has been conducting studies about local content that they promote. And we found the, we found the following findings here in the slide. The challenges that these countries, seven countries face, first of all, involve weak industrial bases. While it's true that Mexico and Brazil are slightly different, the rest of the countries, like Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, you can see that there is a weak industrial base for promoting local content. And in all the countries, there is in the oil and gas sector, you find corruption. There are corruption, cases of corruption. One of the biggest has been Petrobras, as you know, that's known worldwide. And there are other specific cases above all related to uh, tax havens and, and corruption in contracts. And at the same time, 
civil society has found that there is a lack of transparency and access to information. There's scattered information, scarce information about the oil com uh, sector in all of these countries. The third point that we found as a challenge is political will. We found that in these countries, a lot of the time, the government's objectives are focused more on getting income and revenues from the oil, gas, mining industries rather than strategies in the medium and long term for local content. And the fourth point is that we've, we've found in a number of countries because of the length of time that they've been exporting oil is that there are constitute, constituted elites above all in the, the oil services sector. Here in Ecuador, for example, we found about four we've had about four decades of exploitation and, and there are uh, constituted leads which provide services to the oil sector. So uh, a new national company has to compete with these uh, companies and that's rather hard for them to do. Another point that we found in the region is the um, if protectionism and liberalism above all stressed by governments. For example, in Ecuador, Bolivia and Venezuela, there are protectionist governments um, and there are governments like Bolivia which nationalized the gas sector and governments like Ecuador's which expelled a number of private uh, companies and strengthened the role of national oil companies here in Ecuador. The same in Venezuela with PVSA and, and again there are also more liberal governments such as in Colombia where there's more promotion of the private sector and this is something that we've analyzed over time and it also affects the implementations of local content policy here in the region of Latin America. Another aspect which is key is that there is unskilled labor in Mexico and Brazil. This is slightly less true, but there is still locally in places like Bolivia and Ecuador and that there's still quite a lot of unskilled workforce above all for more technical when it comes to more technical jobs and the most important finding in the region is that there's lack of local content frameworks. Well, there is some provision for regulating local content in the oil and gas sector for promoting job creations and there is in general a lack of legal frameworks to promote local content. So to go into more detail here, this leads us to the fact that there is a lack of information and data for measuring local content. While there are some laws which promote employment, there are no laws or methods or data to tell us whether this is actually being carried out or not. Another finding here is that local content here in the understand must be understood as a comprehensive strategy to generate linkages and skills development apart from generating jobs. In many countries in the region, all the countries in the region have clauses which promote job creation from in the oil and gas sector, uh, but few countries go further and promote linkage to further job creation or promote the development of skills. And this is general in Latin America with regard to job creation. And the next point is the short-term and long-term relationship. And the the short-term issue is found in countries where jobs have been created in the sector, but you find where there's a oil block or, 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 a, or a company leaves a local area, it creates problems for that area. Another issue we found in general was the productive densification is not in the Latin American agenda as a key issue. So we formulated this chart which is based on the source of the Colombian Sustainable Investment Fund and the FARO group adapted it for the countries which export oil and gas. So you can see here what we were talking about. With the exception of Brazil, all the countries in the region have requ requirements for jobs. 
in their local content policies. Only Brazil and Mexico, and Mexico does have requirements for procurements for local purchases. Only Mexico and Colombia have specific requisites for training, so they have hours that are specified, hours, amounts, and so on. The same goes for technology transfer requirements. You can find that in Brazil and Colombia. For monitoring and enforcing mechanisms, you only get frameworks in Brazil and Mexico and government obligations for promoting the programs for private companies to promote local content are only found in Brazil and Mexico, whereas in Argentina, Ecuador, Colombia have none. They only have some job creation schemes in the oil and gas sector, but Brazil and Mexico, you can see they do have established strong framework on frameworks on local uh, content. Other countries have particular characteristics. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about Brazil, which is something that we can learn from in Latin America for Africa. And in the case of Brazil, the government takes all the decisions with respect to the sector. An important point in Brazil is that their local content strategies have only just have only not only prioritized the policy, but they've also prioritized national industry participation in the oil sector, so there are clauses for this sort of thing. There are, there's an entity, an institution created by the oil law which regulates, supervises and implements and measures the pr practices and policies on local content. In the case of Brazil, this is the National Petroleum Agency. It was, it also produced a detailed little framework on how local content should be handled, and as I said earlier, it has special stress on how to maximize the participation of the national industry in the oil and gas sector. There's a national oil company, which is strong, and it's called Petrobras. It doesn't only operate in Brazil, but also internationally, and it's managed by the state, but also has private shareholders. We can find that this is a key company. It's one of the mechanisms which is key for providing, for pro promoting local content. Another important uh, mechanism is that it includes local content quotas applicable to procurement processes. Finally, Brazil has something which is that these bidding processes are another mechanism so that other fields include the importance, the, the more put stress on local content. In Mexico, there are also specific provisions in the legal frameworks for local content, and Mexico's objective, national objective, is that it should encourage local content by strengthening national industries and suppliers. So Mexico goes beyond this. It, one of the mechanisms to encourage local content is through strengthening national industries and suppliers nationally and locally. Similarly, Similar to Brazil, it has a national oil company, which is Pemex, it's strong. It has a very strong union, and the, that is why Pemex has one of the highest rates of Mexican or national workers, because of the role the union plays in jobs. The Mexican hydro hydrocarbons law encourages local content through specific provisions, and it has three objectives to strengthen the national hydrocarbon sector, strengthen the providers, and strengthen the industri industries nationally. <coughs> this hydrocarbons law also sets clear criteria for measuring local content in Mexico. There's a formula for working throughout the sectors in multi-agencies to measure the the policies applied by the companies. Finally, Mexico also has a public fund 
to promote the development of national suppliers in the oil and gas sector companies, both national and international. International. We've included Colombia because we feel it has some very important lessons also for Africa. Unlike Mexico and Brazil, Colombia has, does not have specific local content provisions. They're scattered, but it does nevertheless promote competencies in private companies through its own national oil company and it promotes innovation. The, uh, Colombia has no laws to, for n national and international companies in this area, but it does promote uh, f free, m a free market, which is a good, uh, a good business climate for companies. It does carry out efforts for companies to train uh, local workers. It also has contracts in the Colombia for exploiting oil, contains skills development specific measures. So, uh, for, as uh, with regard to lessons from Latin America, we, we've mentioned Brazil. The inclusion of the LC requirements within the bidding processes in Mexico, again, there are efforts towards the development of suppliers, for training them, for these to be part of, uh, for this to be part of the procurement process. In, in Colombia, the extractive sector works together with the government, the public and private extractive sectors work with the government and promote com competence in equal conditions. We found that there's a business enabling environment that, that really matters, particularly in Colombia and in Brazil and Mexico. Both these countries promote the job creation and also training and capacity building and technology transfer and developing national industries. Nevertheless, as a lesson we, that we have found in Brazil and Mexico, we can find that they are rethinking their LC strategy in Mexico, which has been a protectionist country for a number of years. It's now moved into a, a energy reform phase to liberalize the sector because uh, so much protectionism uh, affected the private sector and uh, that undermined production in Mexico. So they're now opening up the sector internationally. And in Bra Brazil, the scandals over from about Petrobras, above all, that this government, Brazil, a few years ago, it's been found that they didn't have the skills to explore and exploit this sort of oil above all the offshore work. So uh, they are also rethinking their LC strategy. Finally, the recommendations that we have from Latin America for Africa about policy uh, that the national oil companies should work together with the international oil companies and private companies. In Venezuela, Bolivia and Brazil, we found that there's a considerable amount of nationalization and uh, we've found there's a lack of capacities the countries have for promoting the oil sector uh, and there's strong and independent monitoring institutions uh, and we've seen this in Africa and in Brazil and in this framework, civil society has an important role as civil society. We found that there are a lot of problems for accessing information because in Latin America, civil society does not have a role in designing or monitoring or implementing local content policy. We believe that there should be strategies for local, in comprehensive local content and they shouldn't focus just job creation, but but for establishing linkages and capacity building. And finally, 
the issue of expectations is important. The decision takers should manage realistic expe expectations in the context of each country because very often there are certain countries which are not able to implement certain local content policies, particularly in the short term. And so an additional recommendation would be the management of expectations. I think uh, I'll just hand the floor to John Akira to tell us something about the situation in Africa, and in the end we will have to be have a discussion over the questions and talk a little bit more about the situation in Latin America on local content strategies. My name is John Okira, and I work with ACCORD. ACCORD is Advocate for Power Region for Development and Environment. We are based in Uganda, and we have been working closely with Grupfaro on the study on local content. We based uh, looked at the African region, and Grupfaro looked at Latin America. So basically for this webinar, I'm going to present the challenges that Africa faces in terms of implementing local content. So first and foremost, I want to begin with the fact that most of the local businesses in Africa require a sound capital base so that they can serve the, 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 the industry. And this is lacking in Africa because most of the companies in Africa lack that skill base. So what they do is they rely mostly on the on the banks. So this limits the quality of the services they, they provide to the oil and gas industry. Second, I want to look at the fact that international companies have a well-established supply base, so they prefer to deal with, with global suppliers and, they, and this puts out the local companies in Africa. So this ki kind of remedy is the competition that the African companies that could provide to the to the international companies. And this in a way also is a fact that this, these international companies prefer to deal with international prefer to deal with the the, the established ties that they have with the, the the global suppliers. So they only go to local companies because they want cut costs but their intention is not to go to the local companies. Then the other issue is we, in Africa, most countries actually lack well-functioning institutions, and these institutions include the enterprise centers, the national companies, the monitoring boards. This will, we will cite and the, during our review, we noticed that Nigeria, which is viewed as a low content success story, is backed by the National Quality Development and Monitoring Board, which is mandated to oversee, monitor, and implement provision of the national Content Development Act. So you see, if all countries in Africa could implement the same, we would have success stories in, in Africa. Yeah, in summer, I want to, to say that in Africa, generally, the major issues we have is, is lack of local content policy. This, this affects Uganda as well, and many other countries in Africa, because without the policy, nothing much can, can be done in terms of implementing the local content policy or the local content provisions so that they can bring out positive outcomes. Then there is lack of transparency and there is lack of transparency and high levels of corruption in Africa. That is evidence in many countries, including Angola, Nigeria, and the so-called big countries or superpowers in oil production. Then there is weak relevant institutions and huge gaps of coordination between the government and other sectors that work along the oil and gas sector. Then there is uh, yeah, basically we we have issue of skills, these inadequate speech skills in Africa, inadequate specialized skills relevant to the petroleum industry in Africa. So because Africa is basically we are in the infant stage of low content, so we don't have not yet drop the skills that international oil companies have. So if we, Africa can team up with the national oil companies, definitely these skills can be built and we can kind of minimize costs in that. Then there is inadequate competitiveness at the international level for most of the local enterprises. You know, these enterprise centers are meant, are meant to impart skills and also they're supposed to act as a passage of information to the local companies. Then we have the issue of low level of technology, the poor physical infrastructure and the high stringent standards required for, by the industry, which are possible to meet. You know, in Africa, basically, as I've said earlier, these local companies don't have the required skills that international companies would wish to have, would wish that they could comply with. So there is basically an issue of lack of the 
capacity to provide the standards that the international countries that the international oil companies can require. So basically, that is, those are some of the challenges that I would wish to elaborate about Africa. There are many others, but in short, those are the major issues. Africa is just in the infant stage of low content implementation, so we are learning from our brothers in Latin America and the elsewhere, in the Norway, Canada, so we are trying to borrow lessons from them so that we can really do our best. So some of the recommendations for Africa, basically, I will talk about is African countries should strengthen the national oil companies and the board to implement local strategy. The national companies should play a prominent role when defining and implementing local content. Its involvement in this process can lead to positive local content outcomes in spite of other challenges such as limited independence from the government. Then we'll also look at the issue of institution building. We look at cases of Sonangoli in Angola and we look at the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation. These countries were able to adopt local content as part of the strategy. That is why you see they have achieved positive local content outcomes. Actually, this is evidenced in our research that we did on the region of the of the African region. Participants can view, can go to it and, and look at the findings that we came up with. This is clearly brought out that, Niger that Sonangol, Sonangol and the, the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation actually adopted the local content strategy and that's why they were able to achieve the positive outcomes. Then we also look at the setting up of training hubs. Training hubs will include the enterprise centers. These enterprise centers, as I've earlier said, impart skills to the citizens and the local companies. They also act as exchange of information between the local companies. So you find that if countries can set up these enterprise centers, we, we evidence this in Chad, we evidence this in in Ghana, in Nigeria, and, uh, and Angola. So because of these institutions, local companies can acquire the skills so that they can ably supply to the international company and the national oil company because of the skill that they have. Then you also look at the issue of uh, compliance with and implementation of local content. It should be a joint approach between the international oil companies and the government, because the government should not only leave the international oil companies to, to implement local content policies to not make sense. So the issue is the responsibility for compliance that necessarily rests with foreign investors. It is clear need for collaborative effort from the stakeholders involved to achieve local content goals at all levels of oil and gas industry. So basically, we, the, the oil industry has to have a joint cooperation. Hmm? The government and international, international companies should collaborate so that they can ably implement the local provision because a cut of which cannot treat the required results that other countries have achieved, like Norway, Ghana, as I said before. So basically, that is the highlight I would give from the Africa side. So let me give back the floor to Marcela to take us through the question and answer session. Thank you so much for listening, participants. John, for your um, for your presentation, and also thank you, Juan Jose, um, for these very interesting insights on the challenges that Africa and Latin America face when implementing local content. Um, at this moment, I would like to welcome. Um, uh, all uh, any questions? So uh, please, I would ask you to use the. Um, the chat channel to pose any questions. Um, in the meantime, I I wanted to highlight one aspect that Juan Jose mentioned in his presentation about the importance of the development of uh, productive sectors beyond the extractive sector. Uh, the, and this remains one of the main challenges for um, a lot of Latin American countries and also for African countries. And some countries in Latin America have already adopted some policies and plans to diversify the productive metrics. So, Juan Jose, I, I wonder if you can briefly talk about the Ecuadorian case and the adoption of the national strategy to, tra to transform the productive uh, matrix? Thank you, Marcela. Yes, just as you mentioned, about 10 years ago with a new administration, one of the national objectives in Ecuador was to diversify its productive matrix. We found that Ecuador is a country that 
highly depends on oil and those uh, revenues and exports uh, uh, depend highly on oil, so the objective was to change the productive matrix. However, during the first five years of uh, the current administration, there, were, there weren't many changes uh, with these regards, and during the second uh, half of the um, current administration, this was sought to be strengthened through um, investments on the uh, hydroelectric sector to change a bit the consumption, uh, the way of consuming um, of electricity consumption here. Now the reduction of uh, subsidies, now the investment, high investment on education in capacity building, especially in uh, terms of careers abroad. Um, uh, University for Innovation was uh, established and one of the aspects that could be related to the local content that has been um, in standby was the investment on refineries. Ecuador, although it's a country, it, it, it's an oil exporting country, it, uh, it, it exports crude oil but lacks the capacity to refine all its uh, crude. So it imports uh, oil derivatives uh, like uh, gasoline. So in this sense, uh, it was sought to uh, start a large refinery, and that was a Pacifico refinery, not only to refine not all our crude, or the crude we produce, and also to meet the internal consumption of um, derivatives, but, but also not only to in, and stop importing derivatives, but also to export them and generate further um, revenues. That would be a strategy uh, related to um, local content, and also with the, that has to do with a chaining uh, based on the oil industry, but as I already mentioned, our country was being faced with some problems to get the funding for this refinery. First of all, we our we we had as partners a company from Venezuela, and because uh, of reasons that we all know, they were they stayed, they were no longer able to be our partners in this initiative. But this change in the productive matrix did not take into account the local content as a strategy to change the productive matrix, but rather the investment on other industries. And as I mentioned, the important part here would be the investment on the refinery, not only to get gasoline, but also other other products that might uh, be useful in the oil industry. But there, have, there, has been, there have been several challenges because of the lack of funding for this refinery. Therefore, the change in the productive matrix efforts in the country have been mostly focused on investments uh, on education and in other industries like hydroelectrical industry, but not on the local content. The lessons that uh, we uh, learned from the Mexican case is that both so much protectionism is not good. For example, in Mexico, it was thought that that Pemex would be the center or the uh, of, of the of the oil production, and it was so that all the national companies worked um, around it, and and that the suppliers were mainly uh, national companies. And what they found uh, in this is that the investment that this, this, this created great discouragement to the investment. So the production of Pemex, because it lacked the capacity to make the necessary investments, that created a, a drop, a, de a, de a, a decrease in Pemex production, and that is causing problems them right now. So they had to rethink the whole strategy, not only in terms of local content, but also in protectionism in Mexico. And in that way, they generated this energetic reform a couple of years ago that looks to open the sector to the private sector both from international and national private investment. So they found that so much protectionism in the sector was not a good thing to do. Another thing, another lesson that we could get from Mexico is that, is that there was no independence between Pemex and the state. So the state demanded um, profits from Pemex and Pemex because um, they had to reduce the investments in order to meet the state's demands, and this also led to a decrease in the production and to the problems that they are being faced with right now. And in the case of Petrobras, what we also learned from here is also the same lesson. 
Petrobras felt that had the enough experience to to manage the oil uh, sector by itself, but and, and well, with the Presal was discovered a, a few years uh, ago with all the reserves in Brazil. They they, they found out that they did not have the um, capacity by themselves to explore this crude in um, at, 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 in, in deep water. So so they had to open their sector to uh, international private investment and international com oil companies. And on the other hand, there were, other, there were cases in which Petrobras, uh, because they wanted to, to, to um, meet all the local content uh, objectives and, and, and they wanted to uh, hire local suppliers and um, labor, they had to reduce their production. So the lesson that we get from here is that, as I said, there needs to be a local a comprehensive local content strategy that not only focuses on protectionism and strengthening the national companies, but that develops a little bit more like the lessons that we found in Colombia, that international companies are involved during this as, as, they, as they walk along in this path. Hello. I am so sorry. I think there was, um, a, we had a, a connection problem, but I think we are, um, we're back, great, excellent. Um, so yeah, I was, um, I'm gonna repeat my last, um, my last question. I just wanted uh, if John can share um, some of his insights on what are the main lessons that Africa can learn from uh, the experience of Latin America. Hi everyone, well, Africa can pick too many lessons from Latin America in terms of low content implementation. You know, we, at Africa and major in most African countries, regardless of Angola and uh, Nigeria, which have somehow high levels of understanding of low content because they, they have been in this field for some good time. So in terms of implementation, we, we learn a lot from Latin America because the local content policies in Latin America in most of the countries are clear and the, the provisions are enforced, which is not uh, an issue in Africa. And uh, this actually, that is the lesson for Uganda because we are just developing the local content policy, it is under consultation. So this will give, Latin America actually gives us a good lesson because it shows us how with the local content policy, what follows and how can we implement the provisions within the local content policy to have positive outcomes. We also bought a lesson from the strong national oil companies, for instance, in the Petrobras, Petrobras and the, that is in Brazil and the other big national oil companies. So the, these countries adopted the low content strategy. That is a, that's why they were able to achieve the positive low content outcomes. That's a lesson for, for Uganda and the rest of African countries because with the national oil companies in place, we should be able to adopt the low content strategy and then that will kind of lead us to the positive low content outcomes that we, we, we see in Latin America. There are many lessons that we, we, we learn because these are all documented and we, we have evidence to this in various literature and reports. So this, if well adopted by most of the African countries, I'm sure we, we can have positive important outcomes. Back to you, Marcela. I also wanted to bring back um, points that Juan Jose brought up uh, was related to the role of civil society. So this is a question for both of us. I was wondering from your perspective, uh, what's the role civil society has when monitoring and implementing local content in Africa and Latin America? Is yes, I think as I, I was saying, I think the role of a civil society is key in above all monitoring uh, the implementation of local content. Not only that, but also the uh, oil sector in the learning alliance. We found. Uh, uh, a lot in this debate and it's come up that the corruption and the lack of transparency is a problem throughout the country, all the countries, not only in Africa but also in Latin America, in the oil and gas sectors in these countries. So there are, there, there have been lessons from certain countries like being part of the extractive industries and transparency initiative which helps to make 
accounts more transparent, but also it's uh, persistent problems, corruption and the lack of transparency. So persistent problem is a, a constant in our country, in the oil and gas sector, in Africa and Latin America. The civil society's role in these countries is key as a watchdog, as a way to do monitoring and assessment and evaluation to see where the money is going, where the money is coming from. And in this, we can also see how local content is being implemented or if it is, and if there is any corruption throughout the implementation of local content. But the problem is, as I said, in Latin America, the role of for civil society is because it's been weakened above all in countries like Venezuela, Bolivia and Ecuador where civil society cannot get involved in the sensitive issues like oil and mining and gas because there are reprisals from the governments and there have been cases in which civil society organizations have been closed down because they've been involved, got involved in these things. So in this sense, I wonder if John could tell us a little bit about what's been learned through the Learning Alliance about the role of civil society in Africa, Africa as a key actor or stakeholder. Well, the role of civil society basically in Africa is to do a lot of research around law content and to advise policymakers where they are channeling, where they are diverting from the law content policies that are, that are in place. So basically as a code, we have uh, civil society coalition on oil and gas and we do a lot of research around oil and gas issues and we come up with reports on the best practices from elsewhere that we can advise our policymakers in Uganda basically to adopt so that we can have better implementation of low content, low content policies. The rest of Africa civil society is booming because as you see in Latin America it is basically to give good police ideas to the Policymakers, because they through the, the research and the, and the monitoring and the evaluation, as the one has ably said, we this was society goes out there to dig for issues that are coming out as regards to content implementation by different institutions, different oil companies. They go to the grassroots, they get ideas, document, they they are able to give policy recommendation to the policymakers. That is brief what I could say. In Africa. Um, Amir is asking um, how to make sure that local content policies target activities that have an impact on other sectors outside oil and gas. And also, I think, um, uh, yeah, there's another question. I'm just going to uh, take the two of them and then I'll go back to Juan Jose and John for answers. So uh, Musambi and Mutambale is also um, saying sometimes I heard a um, recommendation to provide an environment that facilitates connection between national oil companies and international oil companies. For me, I feel like the two companies will work as competitors. Isn't this a challenge by itself? For the case of Tanzania, for example, the national oil company has a mandate some has mandate sometimes failed to oversee to have a decision on what international oil companies are doing? What kind of interconnection might provide positive impact in such conditions? So um, the, uh, these uh, questions you can, uh, Juan Jose and John, you can either answer. I'm going to go back to Juan Jose now uh, so he can answer uh, both of them. Thank you, Marcela, and thank you to the participants for your questions. Uh, with, regard, with, the, to the, with, the, with regard to the question from Mozambia, yes, the recommendation was to, in the case of the lessons from Latin America, from the joint work of the NOx with the national oil companies and the international oil, uh, oil companies, because in Latin America we find specific cases in which protectionism to the sector Okay, in which giving too much uh, power to the national oil companies has generated delays in uh, the deliver deliveries of production and, and that has gone in detriment of the oil production. This is, for example, uh, for example, we have the, the, the case in Ecuador that um, as a result of the current administration, several private companies were uh, expelled and, um, and there was a need to uh, establish another national new national company because of the new the new blocks 
that the national company had to uh, take on. And at, at, the, at, at the beginning, it worked. At first, it, it worked. So in this company was a, in charge of procurement and local employment practices. But as time went on, these companies, these two national companies, lacked the capacity to keep the production levels that the private companies kept. So this not only affect, affected the production, but also affected the local employment, the national employment that had been generated as a result of this production. So, so the recommendation uh, would be around would revolve around that that there must be a cor the correct balance between the national companies and the international companies. We have seen in Colombia. We also carried out some field work in Colombia where we found that the national companies have a more favorable uh, environment to work in, in which Ecopetrol, which is a national company, works in the, in the same uh, conditions as the international companies, companies, and this creates a great competitiveness, and that level of competitiveness uh, forces both Ecopetrol and the private companies to uh, meet the local uh, content demands and to innovate their extraction techniques and that's why the finding in Colombia was that the business environment counts when when it comes to implementing the local content in Colombia. Now I'll give the floor to John and they will carry on answering the questions. Uh, I would like to respond to a colleague from Tanzania who talked about the collaboration between the national companies and the international companies. Truly, we, have, we, we know all this that the international companies majorly have uh, the expatriates because these are trained officials. So these national companies basically are just coming on board. So with the skill that they acquire from the international companies, they are able to do what the international companies do because we know it is an expensive venture to hire expatriates to work in national oil companies because of the, the low capital base that national oil companies may have and as compared to the international companies. So I would recommend that the, there is harmony between the collaboration between national companies and international. Just like in Angola, for instance, they, they put a threshold that the international oil companies should have at least 70% of their staff working as Angolans and then the rest should be, be left to the international oil companies to decide on who. I think this could also apply in all, in all other countries, basically in Africa, and I should say so in Latin America, this kind of indigena, it creates a local, local workforce that is able to, to supply the national oil companies. Yeah, that is basically what I would say for now. Thank you. Back to you, Masera. He's, uh, he's asking, uh, local content is very vital in policy formulation, but to what extent should the policy be crafted in order not to drive away foreign commercial um, oil and gas investors? Um, I'll, go, I'll go back to you, Juan Jose. Thank you for the question. It's a very interesting one, and it's just what we've been talking about, really. How, how can local content policies not frighten off foreign investment in Latin America. We've seen a number of examples of, of encouraging, fostering local content policy. And there's been a reduction in foreign investment. And so there has to be a balance between a local content policy which should not ignore, which should not be detrimental to international investment. And in the case of the the fall in oil prices, we found that very often the national oil company here in Latin America is no longer able to generate the same amount of jobs and hire the same amount of suppliers that they used to. And we've, they have been forced once again to look to foreign investment and f foreign companies in Ecuador. A number of blocks have been turned back to foreign companies to operate in them and so that's why we recommended that there has to be a balance, a, a big, a really serious balance between foreign investment and private investment and the national oil companies uh, over against national protectionism. 
Is you want to add something, John? I would wish to add a voice to what Hofasar said. This kind of, the local content policy should not be intended to drive away the foreign investors, the, the international companies, if I would say. Because at the end of the day, you, the role of local content is to promote the use of local and available goods. In, and that should be the best in all countries, let me say, in Africa, be it Latin America. So the issue is you should kind of put a stretch on the foreign investors so that they don't go beyond the boundaries. They should try as much as possible to stay within the boundaries of a given country in which they reside. They should only go out and deal with uh, the, the, the international or the outside countries if what they require is not being supplied within the locality of the operation. So I would, I would also say there should be a balance so that because the, by the end of the day, you also need the foreign investors in place because they will bring in new, new initiatives, new ventures that are not being supplied by the local companies. Back to you, Masala, please. To both before we close uh, this session. So Amir asked uh, before on how to make sure that local content policies target activities that have an impact on other sectors outside oil and gas. So uh, this question goes uh, also for Juan Jose and John. Uh, so John, if you have uh, any insights or thoughts on this. Thanks for that uh, interesting question, participant. Yeah, you have to look uh, around the, 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 the activities around the oil and gas. So when you are trying to bring up a local content policy, try to target those activities you think the local, the local companies can provide so, so that you don't put in place very expensive, very huge uh, services that the, the local companies may not provide in that case. So in, in, in this case, policymakers should try to come up with the policies that are really country contextualized. Like in Uganda, you should not, uh, you know, yeah, I know the, the, the oil company should be started like elsewhere, but I, I mean, it should kind of give uh, kind of incentives to the, to the local community to, to provide goods and services. Yeah, that is what I would say, but maybe I hope they can, can add a voice to this, uh, the side of Latin America. I was not the Spanish uh, channel. What I mentioned is that uh, Amir's um, point is very, very valid. The policies of uh, local content that are only focused on the oil sector and how, as to how to generate local content in the oil sector without thinking or taking into account other sectors could be contraproductive productive and that would create and could, could, could create further dependence as we have discussed in the learning alliance and here lies the challenge how can we measure how we can uh, check that this is happening in a poli that the policy of local content is also reaching other sectors for the case of mexico that has a very specific uh, formula to measure the local content and also the case of brazil we these formulas include how <clears throat> how much of a content, a national content, or how much from other sectors, a supplier to provide certain services to a specific sector. Uh, so here we check how other sectors are being included by the oil sector. But as it was, as I mentioned before, because there is a lack of local content frameworks in Latin America, there is this challenge as to how to measure this type of dynamics and especially that there is an institution in charge of carrying out this measurement and taking out the m relevant measures if these if, if if the if the goals are not being met and to the participants as well for your questions um if um uh, we have another question uh, from Charles Onak. Uh, his question is, um, what is so far required to measure the success of local content policy? And in a situation where there are no quality da data available due to the lack of transparency in the country. Um, I'm going to give uh, John the floor back. Uh, so John, you can uh, answer the question. Thank you for that interesting question, uh, dear participant. Yeah, in case there is no clear data to, to basically measure local content, and that actually you, you, you kind of ask the right person because we face the same challenge as we are trying to do our research on the regional evidence paper on the Africa side. So we have different measures of measuring log content. So we have the log content aggregate, 
that is the desk measure. And then you can look at the projects, the like enterprise centers. You can look at the, the, the results. You can look at the outcomes from different enterprise centers that are basically dealing in oil and gas. So you can based on that to, to, to say maybe because of these enterprise centers functioning in a, a clear environment and a business enabling environment, these are the outcomes. Because we, 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 we kind of looked at Angola and, the, and Chad and the basically focused on enterprise centers to draw our conclusion that because these enterprise centers are operating in a, in a smooth manner, we, we kind of use that as a measurement for low content because they are actually driving at low content. So basically, I would like to say that it is not that you cannot measure low content because there is no clear data about the, the employment, about the skills acquired. Basically, look at a unit of measurement. Look at the enterprise center as a basic unit for your measurement. Look at if you have the low content aggregate, I would say it's also okay. Then you, you can decide on which measure you want to take so that you, you don't totally have nothing to, 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 to discuss as regards measuring low content. Or say, maybe you could also add a voice to this. In these countries, um, set uh, targets. For example, in the case of Angola, where it has a certain percentage of Angolaization of its uh, workforce. And there are indicators. It, it, they, they, they measure, for example, the percentage of nationals working in the sector. In that case, if uh, they set a target within a specific period of time and they met it, we could say that that policy was successful. However, as I mentioned before, this goes a little bit beyond for, in our view, goes beyond just from just generating employment. And, and that was one of the challenges that uh, we're being faced with in our research, that we generate certain indicators to measure the outcomes for the countries in, in local content. And the problem was that we lacked the data in most of the cases to analyze those indicators. So that is a very big challenge that we have, especially in this Latin American region, the lack of data on local content. So in cases of countries like Mexico and Brazil, uh, this is a little bit uh, less serious because these countries do set objectives and targets and they create the data to, to, to find out if they are meeting the, their goals. In other countries where they have uh, more scattered policies uh, or, or less specific policies, here they have, they're being faced with a greater challenge because they do lack the data to measure whether this objectives uh, on local content are being actually met. If uh, there are no further questions, I would like to close this, um, this session on the challenges of local content. I, we will make sure to record, uh, to, to share this recorded uh, webinar into the, into the Learning Alliance page. And so you can have access to, to, to the information that we shared today. So without any further, I just, um, I just, I just wanted to thank you all for your attendance and yes, thank you very much. And also thank you very much, Juan Jose and John, for your presentations. So uh, goodbye and uh, please let us know if you have any questions or if you require any additional, anything additional from our side. So goodbye.